Good evening and welcome to The Late Debate. Tonight we talk to Ian Duncan Smith, the man at the heart of the two central issues in British politics today, Brexit and welfare reform, and a man who has experienced the highs and lows of politics since entering Parliament 25 years ago. Politicians rarely get to choose their place in history. Ian Duncan Smith may well be remembered as the self-styled quiet man. Do not underestimate the determination of a quiet man. Mr Duncan Smith has represented Chingford in North East London for a quarter of a century. He inherited the seat from Norman Tebbit. As a backbencher, 20 years ago, he raised concerns about the dome being built in Greenwich to celebrate the millennium. There are real question marks about the amount of money and what is it going to be used for afterwards. The former army officer was quick to speak up when it looked as if the military ceremony beating retreat was under threat. It's all very much the antithesis of everything New Labour believes in, so of course they want to consign it to the dustbin of history. In 2001, the MP, universally known as IDS, entered the Tory leadership race. To begin with, he was the outsider. The favourites were Michael Portillo and Ken Clark. I'm very confident I'm going to get through, but then you wouldn't expect me to say anything else, would you? That confidence, it turns out, was well placed. I therefore declare that Ian Duncan Smith has been duly elected as leader of the Conservative Party. But the job of leader of the opposition didn't sit comfortably. His quiet man speech to the Tory conference in 2002 was mocked, prompting this a year later. The quiet man is here to stay and he's turning up the volume. By now his leadership was in trouble. Some MPs stood by him, like Maidenhead's Theresa May. But a coup was fermenting and Mr Duncan Smith soon faced a vote of no confidence. They voted 75 in favour of Mr Duncan Smith's leadership of the party. They voted 90 as not confident in his leadership. I will stand down as leader uh, when a successor has finally been chosen. On the back benches, he set up the Centre for Social Justice, a think tank for ideas to tackle poverty. David Cameron rewarded him with a cabinet post, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Under his watch emerged the controversial bedroom tax. Then, last year, he resigned in protest at cuts in payments to the disabled. IDS wasn't the quiet man for long, soon emerging as one of the Tory cheerleaders for the Vote Leave campaign. And I'm delighted to say that Ian Duncan Smith joins us in the studio tonight. Mr Duncan Smith, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for this... that little reminder of my past. <laughs> You're one of the few politicians who doesn't age. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, so this, this week, The Telegraph labelled a number of uh, mm -hmm. MPs, including two Londoners, Stephen Hammond and Bob Neill, as mutineers mm -hmm. over Brexit. Are they, are they mutineers? Are they wrecking Brexit? Well, I mean, each MP has to make their own minds up about whether they want to support uh, the government position or not. I mean, I rebelled over Maastricht uh, 25 years ago, I think it was. Uh, and, you know, I came in for some fairly rough trade at the time. I mean, a paper, I think, said I could look in the mirror, see my career behind me. I must have been walking backwards ever since. But the point is that it is, you know, it's a rough old business politics. So whilst I, I, I don't... You know, I'm, I'm not happy and content that, you know, people get attacked in quite that way. Uh, I, you know, I think that's over the top, really. But my general view is, by and large, that, you know, if you rebel, if you believe in it passionately and strongly enough, it's not going to be easy, nor should it be easy, because your government, with its manifesto, will want to get its work through. And sometimes, if you want to rebel, it should be, you know, more difficult. So, but having said that, you know, they're entitled to their views and opinions, and I respect them for that. And, uh, so you could forgive them? Well, I, I have nothing to forgive, really. I, you know, a serial rebel that I was at the beginning of my time, I couldn't possibly attempt to forgive anybody. All I say is they're, leg you know, because they are friends, colleagues, and they remain so. They're not, you know, just because they disagree with me on something, I don't think anything the worse of them. Does Brexit give you any sleepless nights? No, not really. I mean, I... Is there nothing about it that worries you? Well, there's loads of things that worry you about whether it's going through, whether it's going to be delayed, what will happen, lots of things like that. But my general sense about it is the British people have made the big difference here. You know, we asked in a referendum, and the Prime Minister then, David Cameron, made it very clear that their decision would be binding. He didn't say it's a, it's a you know, consult consultation. It was a binding referendum. We then eventually had a vote in Parliament after it, and that was overwhelmingly that we should get on with it and trigger Article 50. I think it was so overwhelming and hardly any room left in the voting lobbies. We then had another vote on the second reading of this bill. And that was won by a significant majority. And then, you know, we've, we've gone on from there. So the key thing is Parliament has to recognise that the public, the people, 17 million of them, 
bigger than any other vote that we've ever had, actually voted But what to about do the this. negotiations? Are you happy, content with the way they're going? You can't be, surely. Well, negotiations are up and down, aren't they? I mean, I've been, was been in business, I've done negotiations. There are times when you have to say, that's it, I've got everything I'm going to put on the table and I'm going to leave. Other times when you do a bit of horse trading. But one way or the other, the important thing is that the European Union also recognises that the UK, its largest single market, it would be it would be ridiculous if the UK and the EU had a worse relationship than the EU has with South Korea or with Canada. So that isn't going to happen. So what we've got to get to very quickly is how do we set that relationship and what is that relationship? Do and you, I think that's the key point. Do you see any merits in no deal? Well, I don't believe there is such a thing as a no deal. I think there's just a trade deal or no trade deal completed and then you would do what we call going into the WTO process, which it'd be in any way. And it's worth reminding everybody that actually the WTO, uh, as actually Monsieur, uh, one of the, the head of the W, the previous head of the WTO, Pascal Lamy, said, it's not a major crisis, essentially, he was saying, because what you do is you have a derogation. So you can have zero tariffs and free trade together for up to 10 years without even striking a deal. So the key question is, do we get a deal beforehand or don't we? In which case, then, do we set ourselves and sort ourselves out to go under the WTO rules? So, you know, the key thing is, should it make any difference to our trade? The we, answer is no. We, we were talking about those of your colleagues labelled mutineers. Some of them mm. have talked about online abuse. Do you get any abuse being a Brexiteer? I've had lots of abuse over the years on almost everything, really. <clears throat> I'm... Uh, my view about uh, the things like Twitter and stuff like that is that they have kind of encouraged people to think that they're anonymous and to dump foul commentary, particularly at women. I think women have to put up with awful nonsense from people at times, and I think that's unforgivable. Uh, if they're talking about constituents saying, I don't agree with you, I think you're wrong or you're stupid or whatever, that kind of goes with the trade. But if it's not abusive or threatening and anything else like that, that's unforgivable. But certainly the trouble is with social media, it does encourage people to think they have an immediate ability to hide themselves and then be rude to you, which is, I think, against the general sense of what it is to actually be part of an electorate. Can we talk about universal credit, your sure. baby, what's gone wrong? Well, actually, no, it's going according to plan. And well, not if you're one of those people who's lost out. Well, just let's be very careful. Some figures that just don't get out there in all this debate. You know, universal credit, when I set it up, uh, it's actually there being rolled out in a very careful way. Why? Because unlike previous things like tax credit, which crashed and burnt and nearly a million people got no money at all, the idea is you roll it out stage by stage, and when you think there's something you need to sort, you sort it out and then you move on, which is exactly what they've been doing. So but it's by actually then it's too out. late. People have already lost no, money. People no, have got hurt. Really. Listen, let me tell you. Under the existing system, far more people fail to get their money. Under tax credits, every year there are thousands of people who actually get enormous bills because they've been overestimated the amount of money and they were paid too much. They have to claw that back. Under housing benefit, they have huge arrears in some of these areas which have you just not dealt with and therefore they end up unable to take work. What's happening at the moment is, and this is unsaid, is that 60% of the people going on to universal credit at the moment are carrying debts and arrears from the existing benefits. So these are not created by universal credit. They're actually arriving on there with a problem. The difference with universal credit, and this is where you know, it needs to develop itself uh, on this, it's meant to solve those problems. So there's a thing called universal support alongside it. And the idea is when someone comes with debts, you put them on a direct payment for their housing benefit. And then what you do is you put them into debt counselling, get them straight. That's the overall package about UC. And they're tweaking that so they get that right. And if someone needs money desperately now, they can get money immediately on the same day. That was always in the system. But they need to make that much easier. And they've been doing that so that people can get that as they arrive in there. So it's all there, but it's rolling out carefully so you can adjust these issues, unlike, as I say, when Labour rolled out tax credits, which burnt nearly a million people. In the film earlier, we saw you a couple of times with Theresa May. You've obviously been very close colleagues over the years. You've been a leader under fire, <coughs> under pressure. Can you understand what she's going through? How do you think she's going to cope? Well, I know Theresa. She's a friend. I think she's been remarkable, actually, because it's been very difficult. You know, she's gone from a majority to no majority, really. And that makes life very difficult for you as a Prime Minister. It's very different being leader of the opposition and Prime Minister. Leader of the opposition, you have nothing. I mean, you have to make all your own way yourself. And, you know, we were at the time when Blair was in the ascendancy. She's in a different position because she's Prime Minister. She does have levers of power to pull. 
I think actually she's doing a really, really good job, and we've seen that in the recent polling, which shows that actually they fancy her more than they do How long would you uh, give Jeremy her? Corbyn. Well, I give her as long as she wants to, to take us through Brexit and to get us through the other side, and she and the party can decide whether or not she wants to fight the next election. That's something she has to decide. You know more than others, because you've been there, the emotional toll it takes on you and your loved ones. What is mm. it like? It's hard, and being Prime Minister is, is even harder in a sense, because you're making decisions. And I think, therefore, she, she obviously will feel the pressure on it. But, you know, I've talked to her. I've talked to her as much as I possibly can. I find that she's very, uh, she's very set on doing the right thing. She is someone who understands duty, believes in doing the job and getting it done for the British public. And as I say, I think the public does appreciate that. What they want from someone is not promises, 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 but actually delivering on some of the key objectives like more housing, getting us through Brexit, focusing on getting the economy right, getting the deficit down and getting people better incomes. That she is very, very uh, certain that she has to do. Ian Duncan Smith, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us this evening. Now, in six days' time, Chancellor Philip Hammond will unveil his budget at a critical moment for the British economy as we face up to Brexit and the demand to end the politics of austerity. He's received lots of advice about what to do, with many arguing he should make good on Theresa May's pledge to put housing at the top of the government's domestic agenda. Theresa May dropped in on a new council flat today. The Stone Grove estate in Edgware is Barnet Council's flagship regeneration scheme. Hundreds of old homes are being replaced by new ones. The Prime Minister claims she's on a personal mission to fix the housing crisis. We know there are lots of planning permissions out there. I want to see the houses being built, the homes being built with those planning permissions so that we can really see a, a new spurt to ensure that younger generations, that people are able to get their foot on that housing ladder and have a secure home for themselves and their family. At last month's party conference, Mrs May hinted at a U-turn on decades of Conservative policy. A new generation of council houses to help fix our broken housing market. But council leaders in London say their hands are tied by government restrictions on what local authorities can borrow. This is King's Crescent in Stoke Newington, another estate regeneration scheme. The new blocks wouldn't be out of place on any of London's upmarket housing developments. There's even a show home. That's because the only way Hackney Council can afford to pay for the project is by selling more than half the flats on the open market. Hackney has become a property developer. We just need some of the freedoms that are available to housing associations. We've got a large stock in Hackney, nearly 30,000 homes, but we're not allowed to borrow against that to invest in new housing. Phase one of this redevelopment will boast almost 500 new homes, but just 79 will be traditional council flats. And Hackney has 13,000 families on its waiting list. I've got three daughters. I've got one of them lives with her in-laws. I've got two still living at home, and they're in their 20s mid-twenties, you know, um, so, and they can't afford, and there's nothing on the social housing list either, so that's hard. City Hall believes new homes need to be built at a rate of 66,000 a year to satisfy demand in London. This week, the mayor published his budget wish list. We'd like to see an immediate and substantial boost to the investment in new affordable housing, investment in infrastructure, uh, powers for us to bring forward public and other land into the system, and crucially, a relaxation around council's freedoms to invest in new housing. For now, authorities like Hackney must come up with other ways to fund additional homes, even if it means selling flats like these for more than £900,000. And joining me now to work out just what the Chancellor should be doing next Wednesday is our Late Debate Brains Trust, the Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, Roshnara Ali, the Conservative MP for Hendon, Matthew Offord, and for the Liberal Democrats, the Carl Shulton and Wallington MP, Tom Brake. Welcome all of you. Matthew, can I talk to you first of all? Theresa May was in Barnet, your local council, I believe you were with her today. Can you clear up one thing for us? Is it Conservative policy to build new council homes or simply to replace existing ones? Well, as the Prime Minister announced in a statement today, as you said, within my constituency, um, she has a personal objective now to increase the amount of home ownership. Uh, and that means ensuring that people are able to get on the housing ladder, both through the uh, right to uh, have a home scheme, 
um, but also she's making monies available uh, for infrastructure projects to ensure that um, regeneration can actually occur. Uh, there are a lot of projects that are in the pipeline that can't come through until that money is spent. But it is now our intention, certainly, that we want to see everyone being able to afford to own their own home in the capital. But what about council houses? I mean, Tom, well, you presumably... Uh, you asked Matthew a question, but he didn't actually answer it, which is, uh, is the government in favour of building more council homes? Uh, and certainly what, what we're seeing in my borough, which is the uh, Liberal Democrat borough of Sutton, they have just started building 90 new council homes the first time in, in uh, 30 years that, that that has been possible. And I think we do need to see a, a wide range of organisations providing homes, and that does include councils, it includes housing associations, and of course it includes some of the uh, initiatives that the government uh, have launched in, in relation to making it easier for people to buy property. So it's got to be a, a portfolio of measures. Roshanara, you must know from your constituency, which has a huge number of social homes, there's a crying need for old-fashioned council estates, isn't yeah, we, there? I've got over 20,000 people on the housing waiting list and what would be really helpful is if the government stopped just talking about it and actually invested the resources needed to um, build council housing as well as so other social housing through housing associations as well. What we've ha found over a number of years is that property developers have been allowed to build with a small element of social housing but it doesn't keep up with the demand for affordable and social housing and so I, I think when Theresa May talks about council housing, she needs to put her money where her mouth is and she needs to make sure that those targets are being met because London has got this unprecedented crisis and it's not just those with the most need, it's across the board and the government needs to stop talking and take Matthew, action. Matthew, isn't it slightly absurd when you see stories like that one in Hackney where the local council has to turn property developer and flog off flats at 900k just so it can build replace old council houses? Well there's a couple of things that I need to establish. First of all, the number of council houses under this government since 2010 has increased uh, over 250,000. Where well, if you true. look under the last Labour government, we're looking at about 144,000 no, in 13 years. That's not true. And you say about Hackney. Now I'll take the local authority of, of Barnet. When I was a councillor there, my council colleagues, and they've continued to do this, they've managed to build homes more than ever before. Now, we saw the Stone Grove Estate there, 1,000 new homes. 45% of those are for affordable housing. So it can be done. I think there needs to be a political will on behalf of local authorities, rather than saying the government needs to keep putting more money in. It needs well, political no, will. Is that affordable actually, housing to buy or rent? Well, when you talk about buy or rent, of the 340,000, 360,000 that the government built across the country since 2010, 240,000 of them are affordable rent. Can but I just say, we uh, built two million homes while we were in government. This government has had a very low number of properties built in London for social and affordable housing. Boris Johnson, encourage private developers to build but many of those properties like including in my constituency were off-plan sales for foreign investors and up and down the city you've got properties that are not fit for purpose that are basically for private purchases over eight nine hundred thousand over a million that doesn't address the housing uh, council housing and social housing shortage or um, the house price uh, hikes that people can't keep up you with. You criticise so, Boris Johnson, but he right. still started more new homes in London in his final year than Sadiq Khan did in his, in his, in his, final his first year. year. In his final year, when the pressure, the housing pressure, uh, became finally he came to terms with that. But the fact is, he only built a, ha you know, a few thousand properties that were actually in the social and affordable sphere. Most of them were in, the pri in private hands that he could point to and say I've built all these homes but actually they weren't fit for purpose they but weren't Sean, four people who can hang on they weren't they weren't four people who need desperately need housing you know I've got teachers doctors surgeons who can't afford to buy homes in London because of, there aren't enough um, opportunities for them to get onto the housing ladder so it is the responsibility of the government to provide more subsidized um, opportunities encourage local councils to build and make take the restrictions away so we've got a proper system of providing housing in our it's, it's interesting to argue about whether Sadiq or, or Boris has built more or, or fewer than, the, than each other, but I think the fundamental problem is that we have a, a major shortage of housing. 
the Liberal Democrats, we estimate that it's something like 300,000 homes a year that need to be built. That is not going to happen unless there is very substantial government investment. What we hope might be announced uh, next week in, in relation to the budget is, is figures of £100 billion to be invested over a 10-year period in That's infrastructure. That's a very ambitious figure. It's not going to be well, that high, surely, £100 billion pounds over 10 years, actually £10 billion in a year in, in, in the context of a government budget is not actually that large uh, an amount. But that is money that will be invested in housing principally but also infrastructure and we think this is achievable because at the, at the moment of course it is still cheap to borrow money the government can borrow money very easily and the strange thing of course is that the government actually give local authorities money so that they can buy uh, shopping centers so they can buy office blocks but they don't seem to want to give local authorities the the, yeah. the, the, the power to build new council homes and that is what we would like to see Matthew the Tories are still wedded to home ownership, but do you accept that there needs to be a lot more social housing in somewhere like London, where the market values of properties mean that they are always going to be affordable to many people here? Well, yes, you're right, but I think the country is still wedded to home ownership. People want to own their own home. And, it's and as simple as that. That's not surprising, but in somewhere like London, it's just not possible. Well, it is possible, as I said, in terms of Barnet, the regeneration has gone on there. We saw the Stonegrove Estate, we have the West End Estate, we have the Graham Park Estate, we have Bittersea Hill Estate. We have huge amounts of regeneration. But if you look at some of the other local authorities, including Liberal Democrat Richmond, for example, they're simply not building properties. Bromley, Conservative controlled, admittedly. But places like Barnet are more than playing their part in terms of the London economy. R Richmond now, is on, actually Conservative. So, well, I so apologise, but even so, places are, like are, Richmond are not for building now, anyway. enough properties. But, uh, but there's an issue with inner London where there's a shortage of land and what we've had over the years is we've got we've had very high numbers of um, house building projects but we've had to work with private developers our council has had to work with private developers in order to get the social housing element the government particularly under Boris I have to say actually made it easier for housing um, developers to have a smaller number of properties that were provided for social housing under section 106 mm -hmm. so you know you put local authorities in an impossible situation where they're not getting the supply they need even with private developers so what I want to see is councils having more flexibility mm -hmm. to do the house building because otherwise you run out of land and you don't address the housing shortage especially in London and, and it's I think not just Matthew, for those Matthew who are needs to be careful needs. about for, the definition of what is what, what's affordable well. because of course an affordable rent often 80% of, of the market rent in London mm -hmm. yeah. there are very many people who can't afford to rent at an affordable rent and therefore uh, more council properties for, for many people is the only way in which they're going to get housed in a decent home. Oh, Matthew, I, I, I know you want to come in there, I'm afraid we've run out of time as always, so I'm going to have to stop all of you. Thank you very much to you three for coming in. The Late Debate will be back again next month. Until then, thank you to all my guests, to Ian, Rashnara, Matthew and Tom, but most of all, thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>